Hey, 42 here. If you happen to be living in London in 1821, you would have witnessed an unseasonably late flurry of snow on the 27th of May. Considering it was almost summer, such weather was pretty miserable. Now, being British, I could talk about the weather all day, even the weather from two centuries ago. But that's not what's going on here. What I'm actually doing is employing a little-known literary technique known as pathetic fallacy. Not to be confused with pathetic phallus, which is something you call your enemy when you've run out of insults. Pathetic fallacy is when we give human feelings, in this case being miserable, to something non-human, in this case the weather. By doing that we can use the atmosphere above London to reflect the bleak feelings of the people below. But why, you may ask, were the poor citizens of London feeling so down? Well, after 20 years of conflict in continental Europe, including the Napoleonic Wars and the Battle of Waterloo, the British economy was as depressed as the weather. For the privileged classes of early 19th century England, there was little to look forward to, apart from raising a few glasses of brandy at the coronation of King George IV, which was set to take place in July 1821. But before anyone could get too down in the dumps, an exciting character appeared in their midst. The exotic ruler of a far-off land, who was apparently in town to celebrate the crowning of the new king. This man, General Gregor McGregor, introduced himself as the Kazik, or Prince of Poyais, a bountiful land in Central America. Haven't heard of it? Don't worry, neither had anyone else. But according to the Kazig, it was a veritable paradise. The rivers that meandered their way to the ocean there were littered with huge deposits of gold and silver. The land was fertile and crops like maize could be harvested three times a year instead of the usual twice. And both fish and game were so plentiful that hunting for a day would deliver a week's supply of food. On top of natural beauty and abundance, Poyais was also blessed with the beginnings of a thriving civilization, which included a democratic government, a fully functional civil service, and its own national bank and military. The capital, St. Joseph, was a thriving town with wide boulevards, mansions, and its own opera house. It was the land of milk and honey, and would you believe it, the prince and his government were looking for investors in what was set to be the opportunity of a lifetime. If all this sounds a bit too good to be true, then congratulations, you probably weren't born yesterday. But the early 19th century was a more innocent era than our own, and hundreds of investors and wannabe settlers bet their fortunes and futures on McGregor's grand vision of a utopia halfway around the world. Of course, Poyais was, like so much that came out of McGregor's mouth, utter b But by the time anyone realised the truth, the man from the Mosquito Coast had pulled off one of the ballsiest cons in history. One that cost numerous people their lives and even contributed to the collapse of the stock market. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. First we need to rewind a bit to the start of this story. Because the only way to understand how a man sold off an imaginary country is to understand the man himself. The Prince of Poyais, Mr. Gregor McGregor. He was born on Christmas Eve 1786 and came from a strong Scottish lineage of adventurers and military men. His father was a sea captain with the East India Company, his grandfather a distinguished soldier in the British Army, and his great-great-uncle was the almost mythical Scottish rebel and outlaw Rob Roy. So, it's no surprise that Gregor had a taste for a fight and joined the British Army at 16. His family bought him an officer's commission, which meant he earned a rank without needing anything as trivial as leadership skills, hard work or merit. But despite the shortcuts, McGregor did show some natural ability, and soon found himself promoted to Lieutenant of the 57th Regiment of Foot within the first year of training, a position that normally would have taken three years to achieve. He'd reached the first significant rung in what would be an epic climb up the military and social ladders. When he was just 19, he married Maria Bowater, the daughter of an admiral and a wealthy, well-connected woman. 
With his newfound access to serious cash, Gregor bought himself another promotion, this time to the rank of captain. The move cost him £900. That's about £80,000 in today's money, but it allowed him to skip seven years of frankly inconvenient work and grind, usually required for that sort of promotion. And you thought pay to win was a modern invention. After a year in Portugal supporting the Duke of Wellington in the Peninsular War, McGregor left the army and moved to Edinburgh where he tried to pass himself off to Scottish high society as a colonel and a man of great importance. His old regiment, the 57 foot, had distinguished themselves at the Battle of Albora, earning the nickname Die Hards. And Gregor was only too happy to take his share of the glory, despite the small detail that that battle had taken place a year after his discharge from the army. In the end, Edinburgh didn't embrace him, and he and his wife moved back to London, where he upped the stakes even further, rebranding himself Sir Gregor MacGregor, Clan Chief of the MacGregors. Had the ruse worked, we might today know Gregor's face from shortbread biscuit tins everywhere, but it wasn't to be. Because shortly after returning to London, Gregor's wife died, and so did his primary source of income. Unable to fund the lavish London lifestyle befitting his made-up rank, Gregor decided to reinvent himself yet again. In the early part of the 19th century, a war of independence was being waged against the Spanish in Venezuela. One of the leaders of this rebellion, General Francisco de Miranda, had made quite a splash when he visited London, and Gregor decided to seek his fortune in Miranda's army. After arriving in Venezuela, he offered his services directly to Miranda, introducing himself as Sir Gregor McGregor of the 57 foot. A military man of such distinction was of course welcomed with open arms. And Gregor was immediately made a colonel, with a cavalry battalion at his command. He had mixed results in a series of early campaigns, but he saw some extracurricular action too, marrying his second wife, Josepha, in June 1812. She was a cousin of the legendary revolutionary leader, Simon Bolivar, the man for whom Bolivia is named, which probably had something to do with McGregor's promotion to Brigadier General in the very same month. He may not have been all he claimed to be, but McGregor knew how to fake it until he made it, and soon enough he began to show something of a flair for leadership, displaying courage and generally distinguishing himself on the battlefield. He ended the Revolutionary War as General of Division in the Army of Venezuela and its neighbour, New Granada. During this time, McGregor achieved his greatest military success, leading 1,200 men in a 34-day retreat across Venezuela, outsmarting and outmanoeuvring two royalist armies at every turn. According to modern scholars, it was a display of genuine military skill, and it made McGregor a legend, earning him fame and prestige. The following years saw McGregor seek further fortune and glory in Florida then under the control of the Spanish. But sadly, the fortune turned out to be mixed and the glory limited. By 1820, after a series of failed offensives, McGregor had fallen out with his superiors and found himself in need of a new image for the umpteenth time. Luckily, the perfect opportunity to create exactly that was waiting right around the corner, literally. It came when McGregor and a group of his supporters landed on the Mosquito Coast, a territory stretching across modern-day Honduras and Nicaragua. In exchange for some rum and jewellery, the local ruler, King George Frederick Augustus, sold McGregor 8 million acres of useless, inhospitable land. But if you've learned anything about McGregor by now, it's that he never let facts get in the way of a good story. Where others saw vast reaches of jungle and infertile turf, McGregor saw dollar signs. He set sail for England at once, and by the time he arrived in London, he transformed himself into the so-called Prince of Poyers. All that was needed for this kingdom to become a reality was some money in the royal coffers and a bunch of gullible suckers to become his loyal subjects. 
When Gregor landed in Britain in 1821, tales of his military successes in Central America were already well known, and those stories gave him a platform of credibility from which he launched a spectacular fraud. He claimed to rule over a utopian land called Poyais, where vast riches awaited anyone brave enough to seek them out. With their extravagant displays of apparent royal wealth and fantastical stories of paradise, McGregor and his wife were the favourites of socialites everywhere. The sales campaign that McGregor fronted for his scheme is quite possibly one of the largest and most complex of any scam in history. He opened Poyer's consulates across England, invented an entire military complete with its own uniform and ranks, designed a flag, you've got to have a flag, dreamed up a complex banking system, and came up with his own aristocratic titles. McGregor gave interviews in national newspapers and even hired singers to roam the streets of London, Edinburgh and Glasgow, belting out Poyesian ballads. To top it all off, he wrote a compelling guidebook to his fictional country under the pseudonym Captain Thomas Strangeways, complete with lavish illustrations. It was all so convincing that a prominent London bank eagerly underwrote McGregor's fraudulent Poyesian bonds without batting an eyelid. Many Brits invested their entire life savings buying up Poyes land or purchasing Poyer's government bonds, worthless shares in an economy that didn't even exist. There were plenty of willing settlers too, mostly Scots who trusted their fellow countrymen unquestioningly. And the more that signed up, the more credible the whole scheme seemed. In the end, there were enough settlers to fill seven ships. In those days, the sheer amount of time it took to travel to far off regions like Central America made it impossible to verify claims like those McGregor made. Plus, most of the stories that reached Britain at the time were of revolutions and changing governments in exotic lands, so the possibility of there being an unknown nation on an uncharted part of the world map seemed totally plausible. With that all counting in his favour, McGregor raised £200,000 from people in all walks of life, from professionals to ordinary families. That's more than £23 million in today's money. Now, scamming people out of their hard-earned cash for your own benefit is one thing, but it takes a special kind of bastard to let women and children board ships to a far-off land that doesn't actually exist purely to make a few quid. Yeah, but that's exactly what happened. The Honduras packet set sail from London on the 10th of September 1822, carrying the first 70 Poyes pioneers. A few months later, a further 200 would escape dreary lives in Scotland aboard the Kennersley Castle. Many of the passengers had even swapped the last of their boring old British pounds for the much sexier Poyer's dollar notes, which were, of course, meaningless pieces of paper printed in Edinburgh. When the Honduras packet arrived at its destination in November 1822, she announced her arrival in port and waited to be met by local officials. But, of course, no one came. Assuming they'd simply been dropped off in the wrong place, the passengers disembarked anyway, most wearing their finest dress to mark this momentous occasion. They set up camp, expecting to be found by the Poyesian authorities within days, if not hours. But when the next 200 settlers arrived, their excitement was quickly crushed, when they found nothing but a group of would-be colonists trying to survive in a makeshift camp. It's fair to say that life in the camp was grim. Torrential rains brought disease, and the colonists descended into hopelessness, discontent, violence, and even suicide. The Mexican Eagle, a ship from British Honduras, carrying an envoy to the Mosquito King, came across the settlers, many of whom were sick, dying, or dead. Those who could be saved were rescued by the Mexican Eagle in free return trips to Honduras. 
The remaining five ships that were due to bring more immigrants to Poyez were thankfully intercepted by the Royal Navy, or avoided landing after spotting the remains of the camp. In Honduras, most of the remaining pioneers would perish when disease ripped through their number. A small contingent would return to London, arriving in October 1823. Predictably, though, McGregor had already left town for Paris, where, almost unbelievably, he repeated the entire deception, this time raising £300,000. But the authorities got suspicious when a number of French citizens applied for passports to travel to a country that didn't exist. And McGregor was eventually arrested after some time on the run. But the Scotsman was a survivor, and in 1826, he managed to get himself acquitted, quickly returning to London with his family. By now, the Poyer's controversy had died down, and McGregor continued selling land shares in Central America, though on a much smaller scale than before. Eventually, he was put out of business when the Mosquito King himself started to sell legitimate land claims for the Mosquito Coast after claiming McGregor had no legal right to the land. Getting on in years and running out of cash, McGregor finally returned to Venezuela in 1838, where he was celebrated as a hero of the liberation movement. In Venezuela, he saw out his final years living off a military pension, dying in 1845 with a full military burial. He never faced punishment for any of the Poyer's fraud, or for the lives lost by the Poyer settlers who'd bought into his sick fantasies. Some historians suspect McGregor himself was probably guilty of believing the myth he'd spun, and that he genuinely hoped to build himself a kingdom on the Mosquito Coast. Regardless of whether or not that may be true, his recklessness and greed ultimately cost the lives and livelihoods of thousands of innocent people. The effects were felt well beyond those who invested too. Speculation in Latin America in general, and in Poyez in particular, directly led to the stock market crash of 1825, also known as the Panic considered to be the first modern financial crisis. The panic saw 12 banks go under and almost brought about the ruin of the Bank of England, all for a country that didn't exist. Gregor McGregor has been dead for more than 170 years, but his legacy lives on to this day. As you've probably noticed, unscrupulous individuals are attempting to part you from your money pretty much constantly. Thankfully, most of them are a hell of a lot less convincing than our man, McGregor. Thanks for watching.